Welcome to Coding Horrors, which is really a quiz about horror movies. I've given this talk a few times and I do like to make it interactive, so I've got quite a lot of stills from horror movies in it. So, when you recognise a still and can tell me what movie it's from, I'd like it if you shout it out. Hopefully I'll be able to hear you, even those of you at the back. Okay, but just a bit of practice first time round. We've got a collection of movies here. How many people recognize any of these? There's the original Wicker Man. Yep. It's Carrie. Yes, Jack Nicholson there. Psycho, the Bates Motel, or the house above the Bates Motel. Yep, Jamie Lee Curtis in The Fog. Um, it's Nosferatu, the original vampire film. Uh, what have we missed? Does anyone recognize the bottom left? That's a classic movie. No, it's The American Werewolf in London. Uh, what are we missing? Uh, the only one I think we're missing at the moment is the young lady third from the left on the bottom row. It's more of a ghost film. It's a Hong Kong ghost film called Rouge, which is very well worth watching if you ever get a chance. Okay, so that's practice over. Now we move into the real thing. Friday the 13th, yes. Friday the 13th. And this is where I hook it into coding horrors. Friday the 13th is a date. So I'm sure you can work out a million and one problems with dates in coding. Uh, so we've got Friday the 13th and we have a simple little bit of date coding. Date storage in a database. It's horrible the number of times I see this. Now, yes, it is possible that the date format for MySQL has been configured to use DMY format, but it's extremely unlikely. Most people don't bother changing it from YMD format, which means that whoever writes this is almost certainly storing their date in a varchar as DMY format. It's a common mistake a lot of uh, particularly very new coders make and it creates a unique set of problems for you. So I created a little table with the dates for all the PHP Northwest monthly meetups this year. That's the set of meetups. And then I write a chunk of code asking for all meetups between the 2nd of January and the 5th of January, because I just want the meetups for, well, I first gave this talk at the first meetup of the year in PHP Northwest, and I haven't bothered to change the slide. So it should return me one date, shouldn't it? That's the problem with using varchars. It does a string comparison, not a date comparison. And if you look on Stack Overflow or any of a million and one other sites which deal with people who are having coding problems in PHP, you'll find a million and one questions. Why isn't it returning me the right value? Always use native date time data types. If you have to use varchar for any reason, use YMD format, at least then, or YYYY MMDD format, and then you can at least do a correct selection. Don't use native date formats like DMY or MDY in any database queries if you can help it, because it just creates so many problems. 
someone else will read the code and say, what the heck's going on here? Now, I'm pretty sure all of you guys are fairly experienced coders and you wouldn't make that mistake, you know better. But if you're mentoring or doing code reviews for code that's been written by more junior members of your departments, your teams, be gentle with them, explain what the problem is and show them the correct way to do it. The real message of this coding horrors is I know that none of you would ever do any of the problems here, but you will come across people, particularly newcomers in development, that do. So be gentle with them. There's only one here that I would sack. I'm sure you'll recognize that when I come to it. Yep, The Ring. Brilliant Japanese film, Ringu, or The Ring, is an excellent film. And again, what's it got to do with coding? Well, a ring is a loop. So we have, again, a database query in a loop. Now, a few years back, I started at a company called Innoved, which looked after school systems. And I came across this piece of code. Give me a list of all the learners and all the classes that they're on. And it was code that actually worked perfectly well. It did exactly what it was supposed to do. And when it had first been written, it had been against a test database with half a dozen students on a handful of courses each. But the system had, uh, was now running in production and we had over 5,000 students. So it was executing the one query to get a list of students and then 5,000 queries plus to get a list of the individual courses for each of them. Again, it's a very common mistake a lot of people make, particularly if they don't understand databases. That query could have been rewritten using a join. I've even group concatted to give exactly the same result as the original query, which just gave a comma separated string. Now, it has been pointed out to me that group concat has a limit of something like 4,000 characters in the return response by default. None of our students particularly were working on that many individual courses, but, whoops, the alternative is to return it without the group concat and let a little bit of PHP code to actually format them as you want to display them on screen. It's a very common mistake, again, for novice coders to make. Experienced coders should always understand how to do join queries or how to make their code more efficient when using the database and not rely on a handful of entries in a test data set. It should, you should always test with real life volume data. So if you've got 5,000 students, test it with 5,000 students and see just how slow it really is. Query like that will run in fractions of a second if it's properly indexed, even with 5,000 students, as opposed to over 30 seconds, which was what the original was taking when I found it. Oh, we have stadium lighting, just like in the football. <laughs> the mummy. Mummies, mummies. This was a fun one, figuring out a coding horror to do with mummies. But mummies are critters which have bandages, or as they're sometimes called, bindings. And I'm sure when I say bindings, you'll figure out what's coming next. Now, everyone knows you should bind your data variables to MySQL queries. Yep, there's the mummy. So we have a query like that that someone came up with. They're trying to do the right thing. They know that they should use bind vars. Problem is, 
bind files don't work for certain things. They work for string literals or numeric literals. They do not work for table names, for column names. They will not work for order direction, but painfully, it will actually work for offset, although it's not supposed to if you're using MySQL. I'm not sure about other databases if Postgres allows it for the offset in that case, but strictly speaking, none of those should be bind var controlled. Uh, validated, verified, whitelisted if, appro if appropriate for table names, or better still use proper modeling for your data tables anyway, so that you uh, don't allow dynamic uh, table names and uh, column names in the first place. This one, I think, is before everyone's time here but mine. This is one of the all-time classics. It's the original Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, I remember actually watching this before I was 18. Yeah, someone had managed to get a video of it and snunk it in to their house and a group of us went round and watched it. Dead code. Dead code clutters up your editor. Why is it commented out? There's not even an explanation there for why it's commented out. But you have to read carefully just to see which lines are actual code and which are commented out. Yes, I know it's syntax highlighted to show it grayed, but your mind is still thinking. It's wasting your time looking at it, seeing exactly what that does. So, this is what version control software is for. This is what GitHub is for, or Mercurial, or GitLab, or even CVS, if you still use CVS. If you're going to remove code, remove it. Don't simply comment it out. And when you commit it, you can explain why you've removed it. That matters a whole lot more. Yeah, it's not an actual horror in code per se, but it's definitely a coding horror. And the more and more of that you see, the more and more time is wasted while you work it all out. There's another fun one. How many problems do we have here? A good IDE will tell you some of them. Some equals zero. Why are we doing that? Again, no explanation. The code is still in there. And if you're using PHP 7, when PHP 7 lexes and parses it, your opcache optimizer will actually remove it so it will perform just as fast as if it wasn't there. But it's still cluttering up the code for you as a human being to read. And then you've got a mandatory variable, options, which isn't used. Why? No explanations. We've not even got a doc block to say what it might have been used for there. When you're working through code, if there's things that need removing, actually remove them. Explain why they're being removed. Don't leave dead code in there because it makes people think, what am I missing? What's, what's wrong? Before they come to the conclusion that the person that edited it, edited it before them probably didn't know what they were doing. At the very least, set a default value for options because throughout your code where you're calling this method, you have to pass something in that's not used. That is overhead. That won't be stripped out by opcache or the optimizer. So you're actually adding coding overhead by having unused arguments being passed in here. 
And that is a beautiful one. Someone discovered there's this magic new operator which returns powers. So I can square the val... But they've left the original code in. Dead code. Night of the living dead. It just wastes the developer's time when they want to make changes to it and have to figure out why is it there? So when you're doing code reviews, always make sure that the code that's in there is being used. When you write code yourself, always strip it out to help whoever is reviewing the, your code. Just makes it a lot cleaner, a lot easier to read. Oops. All right. Well, this is the ring, but it's the absolutely abysmal American remake of the ring. And when it comes to remakes, there is only one coding paradigm that I can apply. Avoid code duplication where you can. I mentioned the company I work for that did the online coursework. I found an example of duplication in their code, the same method, in 21 different places in the code base. Now my problem is, one of my first tasks was making a change to that method. I actually discovered it in 20 of the 21. I fixed it. I fixed it by creating a single method that all those 20 places called and it still didn't work, which is when I went back and found that there was one more that was being called. But I had to go trawl through step level debugging to find that it was calling it in yet another class. So unless there is a very valid justification for code duplication. If you're working with domain-driven design, there may then be justifications within your domain models for what is duplicate code initially, but which may well change over time as the domains are refined. If you're not working with DDD, then there's absolutely no justification for duplication of code. Yeah, this is a gruesome film, nor is it one worth watching. No one here has seen Chain Letter. Oops. Chain Letter is not worth seeing. Chain Letter has a lot of people being killed in all manner of gruesome ways with chains. It's a slasher movie. There's meant to be some kind of story behind it, something to do with the guy's uncle wants him killed by the serial killer so he can inherit, and he actually has a twin sister he doesn't know about, which tells you it's not worth watching if they have to have that kind of... And yet they made sequels as well. I have not bothered watching the sequels. But chains, chains, chains. Okay, a user table. Look at those followers. Followers, comma-separated list of primary keys for other users that follow you. Ooh, okay. <coughs> Again, this is a very common novice mistake. Want to find all users that follow user ID 1. Hmm? Hang on. One follows one? No, one doesn't follow one. Oh, there is a one in there. It's part of ten. I'll post a question about this on Stack Overflow. I need to figure out what, how I can do this. You get four or five of these a day on Stack Overflow. And people answer with answers like that. Well, put the commas in so that we're explicitly looking for one. That doesn't work either. Okay, it's because of the comma, isn't it? If the first entry in the table is one, then there isn't a comma before it, so I need to work it. 
That should work. Yay, I've got the right answer, finally. I only have three conditions there that I'm having to check, it, check on just to find who follows user one. It is at least giving me the right answer, and that's a plus. But it's a horrible query to format on a database. Yes, it does work. And then people will come and say, I want to be able to unfollow user one. So they have to work out which entry it is in there so that they can strip it out, make sure they don't leave a... You get an awful code base with people trying to do what should be a very simple thing like that. Even something as simple as adding a new entry, if it's the first entry, you don't want the leading comma, do you? Well, it won't break if you have it, but... And then there's the indexing. When you've got thousands of entries like that, it's not an index search, it's a full table scan. It's going to take forever as that user base grows, especially for people that have lots of followers. So, chain letter, my interpretation of it, comma-separated lists of primary key values in a column. This is what data normalization is all about. A lot of novice developers, again, treat the database as though it's some kind of flat file. It's not. It's a relational database. Even if you want to use it as a flat file, there's better alternatives than a comma-separated list. But it's so common that... Oh, there we are. The developers of MySQL itself actually produced finding set. It still can't work with an index, it's still slow and inefficient, but it's slightly better than that three condition query. So you find a lot of answers like that. But the real answer is normalize your database. Separate table for followers and user join query. So when you code review someone and you find something like that, explain the joys of data normalization to them and show them how it makes their query a lot faster. The mummy returns. I said don't go for sequels, but some sequels are just fun. I think I've enjoyed all the Mummy films so far because they don't take themselves seriously. It's serious, uh, <coughs> serious sequels that are the problem. So, The Mummy Returns, more about binding. Yes, there are more binding problems. And I think, yeah. I occasionally get nervous when I'm giving talks and I double click this thing by accident because my hand's trembling. That's the right one. People using like when they're doing bindings often try writing code like that and it doesn't return anything. It, I'm trying to think, would that actually give an error? I've never tried it myself. I've come across it a few times, but I've never actually tried running a query like that. I think that would error on the binding because there's no foo to bind to. Um, but if you want to bind using like and you need the percentages, you don't want the quotes because you're binding a string, you write it cleanly. You bind foo and you add the percentages to the string that you bind. Again, it's someone trying to do the right thing using binding. Someone that just needs a little bit of guidance on how to do it. And then you often find instances like that where we're searching for, for a string in two possible columns of the database. Now, there was actually one version of PHP where that would have worked. I think it was about 5.2.8 or something like that. But 
for every other version of PHP, it won't work. You can't use the same placeholder, named placeholder, for binding. You have to use unique placeholders. So we use Q1 and Q2 if you're doing something like that. Again, it's an easy mistake to make. And if you started with 528 of PHP and it worked, you probably don't understand why your code won't work after an upgrade. Of course, you shouldn't be running that older version anymore, but you never know. Oops. Double clicking on that one. Everyone should know what film this is. Yeah. Halloween. Halloween falls on October the 31st. So, we have more date fun. Date fun that occurs on the 31st of a month. So in this case, we have a nice little bit of code. Um, another company I worked for a fair number of years ago used to give a test to all new starters uh, or all people that were applying to the company. And that was to work out a particular date in each month, the date at which a bonus was paid, which would be the, I think it was the second Wednesday of the month you got your bonus paid uh, for that month. So you saw a lot of code which did try and do things like this to work out the list of months during a year. And you got to credit this, this uh, candidate for the uh, job because they're using date time objects, they're using date interval, they're using date period, they've even created a generator in there. They're showing off a lot of skills. And they cost me a heck of a lot of time because I recognized that this was a problem. And I knew that normally it would return a list of months and years like that. But, and I'm sure you can see what's coming here, as you can with any good horror movie, if it was the 31st of January when you run this, it's very well documented behavior. So I set my virtual machine date time to the 31st of January and I ran it and sure enough it did exactly what I expected it to. It skipped February and, uh, and so on. February, March, April, May, it gave me the extra month the following year. I can't accept that except in setting the date time to the 31st of January in the virtual machine I'd forgotten that I hadn't enabled the switch to keep it from changing it on my desktop. And all of a sudden, a lot of scheduled jobs on my desktop triggered. It took me about half a day to actually clean my desktop up afterwards. I was not best impressed. That candidate didn't get anything any further forward within the recruitment process. Not only erroneous code, but that cost me all that time. And yet it's such a common mistake to make. Stack Overflow, six months every year, you'll get people having problems with that. Six? Well, every month that doesn't have 31 days, basically. Uh, or every month that does, but where the next month doesn't, you'll get problems occurring. People seem to assume that adding one month will give you the same, well, except it doesn't even give you the same date. You have to understand what date times actually do when you add a month. The best solution, if you're just after the month and the year, is to use the first date of every month, which is easy enough to do. That's the same code with one minor change. We're passing something into the original call to date time. That's the only change needed to actually fix it. Common mistake, easy fix. When you're doing code reviews, be gentle with people. I mean, the coder that I rejected for that might have been a very good coder. I'll 
probably never know, but uh, it just irked me and I wasn't as gentle perhaps as I should have been. Oops. Yeah, the original alien film. And what's the significance here with code? It's the space. Look in horror. What this code is doing is checking to see whether the string file URL begins S3 colon slash slash. Why is this horrible? It actually works. 100% it'll pass every test you throw at it. If you think about it, it's actually quite a clever workaround. But it's a workaround to a problem that doesn't exist. It does tell me two things about the developer. First off, that they can't read the PHP documentation for STR POS. Second, they don't understand the difference between false and zero. That's the only developer I have ever come across, except I never came across the person that wrote this, that left the company before I started. Otherwise, I'd have made sure they got their P45. If you can't read the documentation, or at least follow the documentation, and you don't understand basic data type comparison between false and integer zero, that's too much really to teach anyone. They shouldn't be a developer probably. They're not cut out for it. Fix. It's easier to read as well. Beginning of the string. No, if I compare to zero, zero is a falsy value. Yeah, yeah I could do that, uh, I suppose. It's the equivalent of the code. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, you could, you could test for an explicit zero. Okay, moving on to the next one. Anyone? This is a great film. Yeah, seven. It really is. Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt, which is a great cast to start with. What's the significance of seven? Yeah, it's the seven sins in this case, but this is just one sin in PHP. Seven, of course, is the highest digit in octal numbers. Oops, yeah, seven. What's the problem here? The problem is that PHP recognizes any number with a leading zero as octal. And we have a set of values there, no one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which are all valid. 08 and 09 are not valid octal. 10, 11 and 12 would be treated as decimal numbers. Now I came across this when it was being used to create a drop-down selector for months. It would display the text and pass the, the key as the actual value when it did the form submit. So That's what was actually being built in the drop-down selector for dates. And this system had been running in production with this bug for a month before anyone actually noticed it. Because you're entering dates, you do the drop-down, unless it's August that you want to input, you probably don't notice August is missing from the drop-down list. September is the start of a school term. 
Again, I'm going back to the education system. So people were putting September in there as a valid date. It's the start of a, a new course, start of new term, start of course. And it's putting zero in there, which is being fed into the date that's being stored in the database, production database. So we're getting all kinds of odd values being entered into the database. It's still unique, but what happens if you have a month zero in MySQL? No, it's actually December of the previous year in the same way it would be with PHP if you use a, a zero in uh, STR to date. Uh, MySQL has very similar behavior. So all the students who are actually supposed to be starting their courses December last year, not September of this year not good on a production site either. And yes, if you look at that code, it lines up beautifully. We have a real artist in our midst who ever wrote this. But artistry aside, just write it like that. It's far, far easier to work with and it doesn't lead to horrible little bugs which easily slip through into production. You, you do a drop down. You're looking for the value you want to select, not that every value that you expect to see is there. So it got missed by testing, got into production. That's a wonderful example of a coding horror. Oh. Pan's Labyrinth. Yeah, Guillermo de Tor del Toro, very weird film director. And this is all about labyrinths, specifically labyrinthine arguments. One day I'll actually sanitize this so I'm not showing which library it's or, or which framework it's, it's from but that is genuine code from a particularly well-known e-commerce framework. How many arguments? 11, I think, there. How do you construct an object of this kind? Yes, your IDE will prompt you for everything you need, but apart from the last one, they're all mandatory as well. Anyone who's ever read The Clean Coder by Bob Martin. I may not quite agree that the optimum arguments is zero, not for a constructor, but 11 is definitely overkill, even three is excessive. And yes, I have written code that has lots of arguments passed into constructors myself in the past. It's easy to do. You need to set all the values, you pass them in the constructor. It's probably a case for rethink your objects because your object is not, almost certainly not, corresponding with the single responsibility principle. It's trying to do too much if it needs that many helper objects as, uh, as part of it, encapsulated within it. Scream. Always fun. What's Scream in PHP? Anyone familiar with it? It's all to do with error suppression. Yeah. The at operator for error suppression. So what's going to happen here? Well, there's a couple of potential problems. Um, for example, if we get no results returned, that will be a problem, but we're suppressing anything like that. If we've lost our database connection, if there's any kind of error within the database query, 
we're expecting it all to succeed because we're directly echoing the result. But if there is any failure, we'll never know about it until we get an error with the echo saying, I can't echo row max page because it doesn't exist. Error suppression should be avoided where possible. There's a very, very few use cases where it's justifiable, uh, but they are very, very few. The correct solution is to trap the errors and handle them cleanly when they do occur. There's one of the exceptions, DNS get record. If you pass something to DNS record that the lookup can't find, which is very easy to do, you'll get an error displayed on screen. So yes, you might want to use at to suppress that error, as opposed to just DNS get record, because at DNS get record, you get a warning displayed. We're going to suppress that. We don't want that appearing on the user screen. Oops, there we are. If we want to be really clever, we write an error handler like this that converts the error to an exception. And we can catch exceptions. We can actually handle it cleanly. Oops, there we are. Same code again. First case using the at, second case not using the at. We're catching in both cases. Oops. So we can handle the exception and echo something appropriate to the screen. We've caught it, we can handle it within our code. But of course, code can be littered with ads if you're working with an old legacy code base. So how do you identify everywhere where they are? And that is where Scream comes in. Scream is a PECL extension. Scream disables at, it prevents at from working. So your code will start displaying the error messages and you can actually work through and fix them and handle them cleanly. It allows you to identify everywhere in the code base where it's being used, which does make it quite useful. Um, apparently, you can do the same using Xdebug, but I couldn't tell you how for the life of me off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, Scream is a way of highlighting an error rather than simply hiding it. And it's as simple as enable the extension and then add that to the top of your code. No, none of you was young enough to remember Night of the Living Dead. This is Dawn of the Dead, the, the sequel. Well, it wasn't a sequel, it was Sam Raimi's second film about zombies. Yeah, much more fun, set in a shopping mall. That guy's coming up in the lift. More dead code. And this, unfortunately, is an example of uh, dead code in one of my code bases. That's one I wrote. I had this wonderful method, PHP to Excel, which accepted, it would accept a string, a, PH, uh, a date time string, it would accept a Unix timestamp, it would accept a date time object, whatever, and it would convert it to the equivalent serialized Excel timestamp. And I modified the code so that I had separate methods for each. This is the method for date time values. I'm using date time immutable because you can get a date time, you can get date time immut immutable, you can get carbon, anything being passed through. It was the safest type hint to give it at the time. What's dead about this? I forgot to change the doc block. 
dot block does not match the signature of that function. So I released that code and I got a lot of people's APIs breaking. They couldn't figure out why because they were working from the dot block, uh, gen uh, the PHP docs generated from the dot block. Passing through something that the code said or that the, the documentation said was valid, but it of course wasn't because of my modifications. So dead code doesn't just apply to the actual code base, it applies to the documentation in there as well. Now of course a lot of that could be stripped out now. Type hinting, your IDE is going to tell you all that. We've got return type hinting so we don't have to say what the return type is. Again that's obvious from the code when you're working with a, an IDE. The only thing that the documentation really needs there is what does the method do? Convert a date from PHP to Excel. I mean, even that's not particularly accurate anymore. I should have updated from a PHP date time object to Excel. So dead code applies just as much to the comments in the code as to the code itself. What's a person to do when they come across something like that? Well, you fix it. The same applies to all of these. When you encounter dead code like this in legacy code bases or in code that you're reviewing, if you leave it there, it's going to come back and haunt you. I hope everyone recognizes that one. <laughs> so, when you encounter these coding horrors, in code, whether it's code you're working with now, new code that you're reviewing, or whether it's legacy code, don't let them become ghosts to haunt you, but exercise them when you find them. Thank you very much. <laughs>